Welcome to the Tying Bench with Steve Hudson. The Tying Bench is a production of FlyKits.net, your source for quality fly tying kits and fly tying guides. The Tying Bench is presented in conjunction with Alpharetta Outfitters, covering your fly fishing and fly tying needs from the heart of Alpharetta, Georgia. Today's focus, the Brim Buster, which just might be the best warm water fly ever. Hello everyone, I'm Steve Hudson and I'd like to welcome you to this episode of The Tying Bench. Today I want to talk with you about some of my favorite things. You know, as fly fishermen, we have lots of favorites. We have favorite fly rods, favorite streams to go to, favorite barbecue places to go to after the streams, and favorite books. I'd like to show you one of my favorite books. It's a little book called The Flying Fisherman. I got this book back in the 60s when I was a little bit younger than I am now. Uh, it was a book that you could request on a TV show called The Flying Fisherman. And if you wrote Gad about Gaddis a letter, he would send you a copy of the book. This is the one I got, and I spent untold hours reading this book and adventuring in my mind and thinking about all the great fishing places I would like to go. It's one of my most treasured possessions, and I still love to read it, even today. As a fisherman, I have other favorites too, and one of the favorite things I have is a favorite fly. If I look at all the flies in my fly boxes, I think my number one choice is going to be a fly called the Brim Buster. I came up with the idea for the Brim Buster several years ago while working on a book called Brim Bugs. It was a book about tying flies for Brim, and the Brim Buster evolved out of the process of writing that book. Since then, it has become my go-to fly for brim fishing no matter where I am, but I've also found that other fish like it. If I supersize it and tie it on big hooks with big materials, bass like it. Trout like it too. Saltwater fish will go for it, including at least one 22-pound tarpon from southwest Florida. It's a great fly, but mostly it's a brim fly, and that's what I use it for. I guess, since it is my favorite, I should share it with you, and that's what I'd like to do today. So ready to get started? Ready to try tying some brim busters? Let's head over to the tying bench and sit down and tie us up some brim busters. The brim buster is a fly that was developed to imitate the nymph of the damselfly. The nymph of a damselfly is a creature that is characterized by large prominent eyes, a tapered and segmented abdomen, and several appendages on the end of its body. The combination is apparently irresistible to all kinds of fish. The fly that we're going to tie today has been designed to imitate these characteristics and does so very effectively. Today we'll be tying the Brim Buster on size 10 or size 12 hooks. We can use either a dry fly hook or a nymph hook. Either one will work, though the nymph hook will be a little heavier and will help the fly to sink a little more quickly. The thing to think about is the length of the hook shank. You don't want to have it too short or you won't have room to develop the body, and you don't want it to be too long or the body proportions will not be correct. I tend to favor a 1XL shank on the hooks that I choose for brim busters, and so far the fish have not complained. The first thing we'll attach to that hook is thread. I'm a fan of using the biggest thread that the fly will allow, and so for this fly I like to use 3 alt thread or 210 denier thread. Those threads are heavy enough to hold the eyes to the hook, an important factor as you'll see in just a little bit, and they're not prone to breakage. One thing you do want to think about is the color of the thread. 
I like to pick a color that matches my body color. Uh, in other words, I'd use black thread for a black body or chartreuse if I'm going with a chartreuse body. The most visually prominent part of a brim buster is undoubtedly its eyes. Made from segments cut from a piece of bead chain, these eyes can be gold or silver or even other colors if you want to experiment. The chain that you'll use to make them is ordinary ceiling fan type bead chain. You can purchase this at fly shops, at hardware stores, or you might take a look at the ceiling fan in the living room. Just saying. Another prominent visual element of the brim buster is the wire ribbing. This is fashioned by winding fly tying wire around the body in an open spiral. My favorite colors, I think, are red or copper, but I'll also use brass colored wire, silver colored wire, and sometimes even oddball colors like green or blue. Don't hesitate to experiment to see what works best in your favorite water and let the fish be the guide. The final piece of the brim buster is the material used to fashion the body in the tail. We'll be using straight cut rabbit, that is, long strips of rabbit hide that have been cut so that the hair on the hide is in line with the length of the strip. These strips will be about an eighth of an inch wide and they come in all sorts of colors. I like to use black, chartreuse, and a color called fire tiger, which is a combination of red and orange and yellow. Any of those can work well, but don't hesitate to try other colors as well. Just remember to match the thread to the color of the body and tail. Today we're tying the brim buster on a size 10 1x or 2xl nymph hook. You can use a dry fly hook just as well. Uh, either one will work fine, so don't worry too much about an exact hook model number, but look at the size and look at the length of the shank to be sure you have room to tie what you need to tie. To begin, we'll start our thread and I'm using three out thread. I like to use the biggest thread I can use on a given fly so that I reduce the risk of breaking the thread. And I'm building a fairly wide thread base over about the front half of the hook shank to start with. This will become the base for the eyes, which I'll add in the next step. So I build my thread base and I leave my thread hanging Oh, an eye and a half or maybe two eye diameters back from the rear of the eye. Now I cut my thread and I'm ready for the next step. The next step is to tie in the eyes for the fly and I'm going to make these from some ordinary bead chain much like you might find on your ceiling fan. You can buy bead chain at fly shops, at hardware stores, or mm, just saying, you could even steal an inch or two from the pull chain on the ceiling fan in your living room. I'm going to cut that with some nail clippers, never with your tying scissors, but nail clippers. And I'm going to cut a little two bead segment, just like that. I cut that off and now I have a two bead segment that's ready to go for use as the eyes of the fly. To tie the eyes to the fly, what I'm going to do is use a technique called X wrapping. I lay the eyes over the tie-in point, not too close to the eye of the hook, and I simply wrap 
six, seven, eight, oh, seven or eight turns of thread around the connection between the two chains, uh, segments. Notice that makes the eyes crooked. The reason they're crooked is that I've only tied in one leg of the X. So to straighten them, and I've turned it so you can see the top view, I'm going to add the second leg of the X. I'll nudge the eyes into position, add the second leg, that pulls them around straight. A little more nudging if I need to. Here was my first leg. The second leg. It makes an X shape. And notice I'm always going over the top and away from me and then toward me on the bottom of the hook. The X wraps will hold the eyes in position and are a great technique to learn for lots and lots of different fly tying applications. Now, I have my eyes on the hook in the proper position. At this point, I'm ready to tie the wire to the hook the wire will provide ribbing on the finished fly, and I'll take a small piece of wire. This is medium or medium large size red wire. I could use a gold wire, a silver wire, even a blue wire if I wanted to. There's no right or wrong here. But I'll take a piece of wire, and I'm going to position it so that the end of the wire is right behind the eyes not up here in front, but right behind them. Then I'm going to hold the wire on the hook. I'm going to take my thread and catch the wire with a turn or two of thread. Then I wrap the wire back to the bend. I see my wire is actually rotated around a little bit. That doesn't hurt anything on this fly. No problem at all. So I've got my wire wrapped into the bend, and now I'm going to return the thread to the point directly behind the bead chain eyes. So I have my wire in place, and my bead chain eyes are in place, and I'm ready for the next step. The next step is to add the body to the fly. I'm going to make the body from a piece of straight cut rabbit. This is rabbit hide where the hair is laying back along the length of the hide. These are also called zonker strips and I want one where the hide is about an eighth of an inch wide. To prepare the body segment, I'm going to take my scissors and I'm going to cut a small piece of hide about the length of the hook shank. I'll cut me a little piece of hide and this will become the body of the fly. Sweep the hair back so it looks nice and now I have my body ready to add to the fly. To add the body to the fly, I'm going to grasp the hide strip so I have good control over the position of the tip end. I want to position that tip end so that it's right between the eyes and even with what might be thought of as the pupil of the eye. My thread, remember, is hanging right behind the bead chain. So I take my rabbit strip, I position the end, so it's right in the middle of the eyes. I press the strip down on the hook and then I take my thread and make a loose wrap and then some tighter wraps to trap that rabbit onto the hook. 
I might add another X wrap or two just to clean up the front. Then I'm going to wrap the thread over the rabbet back to the bend of the hook. Notice as I do this that I'm sliding the hand holding the rabbet back ahead of the thread. I'm chasing the hand with the thread that allows me to keep the rabbit on top of the hook. When I reach the bend, then I return the thread to a point right behind the bead chain eyes. If the eyes have moved a little, and these did, I just put them back in position. They'll move around until the fly is finished. But now, I have my brim buster with a tail attached to it. And I want you to also note that there's a small piece of hide right here, hanging out behind the back of the hook. That's a design feature. It acts like a keel and helps to give the fly some great action in the water. The next step is to wrap the ribbing wire. I take my piece of wire and holding the tail so it doesn't rotate, I wrap the ribbing fairly tightly in wide spaced turns toward the front of the fly. It will take, oh, probably four, maybe five turns to reach the front. And when I get to the front, what I do is pull the wire between the eyes. From the top, it looks like this. I'm pulling the wire between the eyes and down a little, and then I just leave the wire there. It'll stay where I put it. Then I take my thread and add more X wraps over the end of that wire. I want to be certain I do both legs of the X to anchor the wire securely. Now we have to get rid of the extra wire on the front of the fly. I don't like to cut that because that leaves a sharp end on the wire which can damage my thread later on. Instead, I'll use a technique called helicoptering. I support the fly from the bottom, grab the wire tightly, and spin it like a helicopter blade. The wire will break and part very smoothly. To complete the fly, I'm going to wrap a few more X wraps between the eyes. I'm adding both legs of the X. Then I'll add a couple of turns in front of the eyes to secure everything. And then I'm going to use a half hitch tool to finish the fly. I lay the tool on top of my thread. I wrap the thread twice around the tool. And then I put the opening of the tool over the eye of the hook and slide those turns off. I'll do that a couple of times to give me some nice secure wraps on the end. And then finally, I cut my thread close to the fly. I like to cut my thread with the back edge of my scissors using it as a knife. It gives me a nice, clean, very smooth cut. At this point, the tying of my brim buster is complete. From the top, you can see the prominent eyes and the ribbing. As I rotate the fly around, you see the ribbing adds segmentation to the entire body. I finish the fly by adding a drop of head cement on the top, right between the eyes. I like to do the same thing on the bottom of the fly, putting a drop of head cement there. It will wick into the thread and secure everything 
giving me a fly that's very durable and that should catch fish for many, many seasons. As you'll quickly discover, it's easy to fish the brim buster. Simply cast it toward cover, count it down to the desired depth, and retrieve it in smooth strips of 4 to about 10 inches. Let's see how this might work out on the water. John is fishing a large river near Atlanta, fishing for bass and brim. He's casting toward cover along the bank, targeting an area of rocks and brush. When the fly hits the water, he does an upstream mend and then begins to strip, strip, strip the fly back towards him before picking up and making another cast. Few fish can resist the sight of a brimbuster dashing for cover or for deeper water, and strikes are often unmistakable. Sometimes that strike comes from a nice brim of some sort, and some of the biggest bluegill I've ever landed have been fooled by a black or chartreuse brimbuster. But bass love this fly too, and you'll soon learn that a bass on a brimbuster is something you won't soon forget. I know many fly fishers who have landed bass of several pounds while fishing for brim with this fly, though the small hook size of a brim buster tied for brim can make it hard to stay connected long enough to land that bass. The solution to that problem, of course, is to go with the supersized brim buster tied specifically for bass. Perhaps one like this one tied with molded eyes and a long body of white rabbit. Oh, and by the way, that big brim buster, it makes a great saltwater fly too. But that's another story. Well, that's about it for today's episode of The Tying Bench. And I want to thank you for taking your time to come and tie some flies with me. I hope you've enjoyed tying the brim buster. I'm certain you're going to enjoy fishing it. And if you'd like to learn more about it or maybe pick up a kit of materials, let me suggest the Tie It and Try It Brim Buster Fly Tying Kit, which has detailed instructions and materials to tie at least 20 flies. I hear the dogs in the background telling me it's time to put this away and go fishing, so that's what I'm going to do. Thank you for being here, and we'll see you next time. To learn about the complete line of Tie It and Try It fly tying kits, including a special kit for tying the brim buster, please visit flykits.net. This has been a production of flykits.net.